go Nebuchadnezzar's fire. We're back in that place talking about what's happening there in Babylon with the exiles who were there, who are dealing with what's happening to them in the flesh while they serve God in the spirit. And this is how we perhaps get a measure of their love of truth. And therefore, it is how we can measure our love of truth as well. That's the rationale behind this lesson. I hope that that rationale holds and is uh, reasonable. It seems to be. Today, we address another topic there. If you recall last night, uh, last time that we discussed this, we were talking about his servants yielding up their bodies. And that was um, we stopped at the place where they said, we have no need to answer you about this. God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're still not going to serve your gods. There's no discussion to be had. This decision is made. We are faithful to God. The first commandment he gave in Exodus 20 was, you shall have no gods before me, no graven images. You shall not bow down to them or worship to them, worship them because I, the Lord God, am the, the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. So that is fairly straightforward, I should say. And not an option. So, at that point in Daniel 3 is where we find in the 19th verse, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was filled with fury. And the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are the Babylonian names given to the Judah, uh, the the captives from Judah that we're talking about here, who are friends with Daniel, or at least associated with Daniel. And uh, the expression of his face has changed against them, which is to say, before they had his favor, they were originally, or he was originally good with them. They had shown themselves to be better than what was before, or everybody else in their class, I guess. They had come out of the training program at the top of their class. They were put into uh, positions of authority. When Daniel's uh, ability to interpret the dream was shown, he also requested that these be placed in positions of authority. So they are high-ranking officials right now at the point at which they refuse to bow. And this, of course, does gather the attention of the chief executive, Nebuchadnezzar, who says the expression of his face has changed. So he has made up his mind that I don't like these people anymore. Now I'm going to destroy them. Before I was favorable to them. Now I hate them. So he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. It's interesting that he has a standby furnace. <laughs> Doesn't sound like the nicest king. Um, but <laughs> he's got a furnace hanging around, I guess, for the disobedient. I'm not really sure. But now that these guys have done this thing and it's considered high treason, he has heated the furnace seven times more than its usual heat. We've got to make sure that we really cook them. That's the idea. This represents his anger, his wrath, his fury. He's filled with fire, filled with that lightning kind of anger. This is quick anger, quick flash burning. 20th verse of Daniel 3, he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. So we have not just military personnel, but the mighty men of the army, those who are the heads, the, the strongest most capable of the force of Nebuchadnezzar. That's what's happening here. 
His consequence is that furnace, that fire, it's seven times hotter than usual because this is particularly egregious, telling him that he is not God. I've noticed that that angers our politicians too. That's just how it goes. When you tell them they're not God, they get mad at you. But the truth is, they're not. God is God, and everybody else is second place. That's just how it is. You have to do what God says, no matter what. So, this has angered him. His furnace is now seven times as hot. He has grabbed the strongest of the mighty men of the army. And we know that Nebuchadnezzar at this point in time is the king of Babylon, having conquered the entire ancient Near East. Every kingdom within, I don't know how far, but within a reasonable large area radius has fallen to him. So, does he have a good army? Yeah. <laughs> do they have the ability to do crazy, outlandish, heroic things? Yes, they do. That's the army that he has. So he's got the furnace, seven times hot. He's got the army, most powerful in the world, but with a, you know, if you want to fight about it, good luck. <laughs> You're going to lose. And this is the power that Nebuchadnezzar represents and brings to the fore, see? It is the entirety of the world. All the power of the world, everything that can be brought to bear against you. So then, at 321, these men were bound in, the, in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. And they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Now, I'm not clear as to what we mean by this was that they were stripped and their clothing was turned into the means by which they were tied up, or whether it just means that they grabbed them immediately, fully clothed everything and just wrapped them in the rope or whatever it was. I'm not sure, but the point is, you know, they are getting thrown in, you know, the whole thing. Whole enchilada, just be gone with the lot of you and everything that you have. Jude said, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. <laughs> so we want nothing to do with you. We won't even hang on to your clothing. Uh, so it's a show of disdain, of uh, untouchableness that they have. And they're tied up and they're thrown into the burning fiery furnace. So what happens then? Well, there's something that happened before then that you got to look at. In Hebrews 11, it talks about those who walked by faith and how they inherited many things and they obtained many things in life because of their faith, and yet they weren't perfected apart from us. The things that were promised have their fulfillment in Christ Jesus. Even so, when he describes the life of faith that characterizes the people of God as recorded in all of the Bible, it comes to Hebrews 11.35. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. And this is absolutely true. We know that sometimes the people of God were killed because of the testimony that they held. Because they were faithful to God in the law of Moses, or perhaps because they were faithful to God in Christ Jesus, say, Acts 7 with Stephen. Um, they suffered torturous death sometimes. They accepted a torturous death sometimes because they refused to accept a release, meaning if you will curse God, or if you will turn down God, or if you will just do this thing, despite the fact that God clearly commands that you shall not do this thing, then we'll let you go. You don't have to die. You don't have to suffer. It doesn't have to be like this. And that's the way of the world. That's the way of Satan. Make a deal with me instead. Make a covenant with me and things will go well for you. You, you know, people will like you. You will be popular. You know, just look at any beer commercial. 
have all the good looking young people, everybody laughing, dancing, having a good time. That's the devil. That's everything the devil promises. Always is, always has been. No better capture of that than beer commercials, really. They got everything. They got it down to a science. They would. <laughs> They're selling poison. But that's the promise of the devil is release. Let go of your fears. You know, let your hair down. Let your guard down. Don't be so uptight, right? That's the idea is release. It doesn't have to be that hard. It doesn't have to be that narrow. That's the devil talking. You know what the Bible says. You know what the Bible calls for. And it could come to something like this. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, that they might rise again to a better life. So they knew that the body wasn't the end-all be-all, that there is something after this, and that that thing is better than what this is. We're not saying that we welcome mistreatment or that we go looking for it. You don't need to do that. Trouble will find you. There's no need to look. <laughs> but you do have to refuse to accept release based on your knowledge that as bad as things might be here, I am looking to heaven. I am going to be right with God. I will be resurrected with the righteous. And this is just a short thing. Life, I mean. I've heard other people say, oh, that's not true. Life is the single longest thing you'll ever do. I'm like, that's correct. It is the single longest thing you will ever do, and it is short. Both. But it's nothing like eternal life, life after death. So this idea of it's the single longest thing you'll ever do is actually not true. The single longest thing you'll ever do is life after death. That's actually the most weighty thing, the most important thing. And those who walked by faith, as cataloged in Hebrews 11, just like these, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they subjected their bodies. They yielded up their bodies for him. I will not sin against God. I will do what is right. It, nothing is going to stop me from doing what is right. And if it costs me my life, it does. I don't want that. I don't welcome that. But there's no discussion. I have to do right. If you're going to kill me, if I do, you know, unless I agree to do wrong, well, you're going to kill me. Because I'm not going to agree to do wrong. As Jesus said, do not fear those who can kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. What a perspective. It's true. They can kill the body, and it's terrible, and there's a lot of terrible things that can happen to you. But, when that's over, there's nothing else they can do. Fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell, where the fire is never quenched. This, this fire of Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm not trying to minimize it, I'm trying to get into their minds based on what Bi the Bible tells us that the people of faith thought. These who were being tortured, these who were refusing to accept a release, were doing so with this in mind. They will rise again to a better life. Heaven with God is better than peace in the kingdom of Babylon. Riches, power, glory, and honor on earth. You know, duly stolen from the working class, working classes and the huddle masses. But, you know, they deserved it. They should have worked harder. You can have that if you want to. But that's nothing compared to what God will give you. Eternal life. Heaven forever and ever. So they're doing this because they know that something better is waiting for them. 
And though Nebuchadnezzar's fire is hot, and I'm sure that's an unpleasant idea and an unpleasant way to die, even if it's seven times hot, it's still going to take you long enough that you're going to feel that. That's going to hurt. Nonetheless, it's not like hell. Hellfire is never quenched. It never stops. It's worse than Nebuchadnezzar's. So they made a good trade, actually, didn't they? They made a good trade. They said, I, I'm going to serve God. I'll get paid back by the Lord. That was a good trade. Terrible though it is. And though we talk about such terrible things, we don't find ourselves in this situation um, every day. Um, you know, here we are. We're all here. There's no fiery furnace that I know of. No, nobody threatening to throw you uh, or murder you right now for doing the will of God, refusing to worship some specific false god. I don't see that happening here. Um, anything could happen. Nobody knows the future. But you know what I'm saying. We're not at that place just yet. And, you know, I suppose, therefore, the admonition of Hebrews 12, uh, you know, remember him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. You have not endured to bloodshed in your stance, your struggle against sin. Yeah, it's worth thinking about. We haven't paid that much. And yet, aren't we willing to do so? I would think that the gospel is worth a lot to you. I would think that the truth is worth a lot to you. That the faith in God is worth a lot to you. At least I hope that that is the case. I would think so. So we go back to Daniel 3. At verse 24, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose in haste, that is, stood up from the throne, not in the ceremonial way, unceremonially, we might say. He declared to his counselors, didn't we cast three men bound into the fire? They answered the king, true, O king. I would let my words be few in his presence as well, wouldn't you? Did we not throw three men bound into the fire? True, O king. Sir, yes, sir. And he replied, but I see four men not tied up, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. The appearance of the fourth one is like a son of the gods. That's interesting. Something's happening here. Um, and, you know, well, that seems obvious. Yeah, but, I mean, there's something besides the obvious. First obvious thing is, of course, we threw three men in there, but and they were bound, but there are men walking who are not bound, and they are unharmed. So that means this is not going the way we expect it to go. We were going to watch them be singed to a crisp, and instead they have come free and are walking unharmed. And there's a fourth one in there who doesn't look like a human. He looks like a son of the gods. Something about his visage, which is not clear to us and doesn't matter, but you know what that has to be. It's got to be that God's messenger, God's representation, an angel of the Lord, if you like. Some say it's the Son of God, Jesus, come in the spirit form, whatever. Those are pretty close to the same thing. The angel of the Lord is the representation of God on earth. When people talked to the angel of the Lord, you may recall, say, Samson's parents or others, they didn't realize they were talking to an angel. They thought they were talking to a man. So it was with Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels that visited. They just looked like fellas. The angels who spoke with Abraham and, um, and uh, um, Mrs. Abraham. <laughs> uh, Sarah, Sarah, <laughs> sorry. I'll never forget old what's his name. Uh, Sarah, yeah, the angels who spoke with them, they thought these were men. Sarah even laughed. But they weren't, they were God. So we know. This is the Lord go, going in, the Lord saving them. Like I said, there's something else happening here. 
What is that? Do you, let me step aside here for a moment and talk to you about the word resurrection from the dead. Do you know what this actually means? In the New Testament, the word resurrection is uh, Anastasia or Anastasis. Um, Ana means up, stasis, or, you know, this is a stance, standing up. And the other half of that phrase is from the dead, which is to say from the necro. Necro is, you know, that, but that, that's dead, but that's not dead as in passed away. That's dead as in corpse. That's a dead body, a corpse, which is why, you know, when they're looking at somebody, somebody passed away, maybe in the past, it can be called a necropsy, right? Um, it's dead flesh, a dead body, a corpse. The words in the New Testament that are translated resurrection from the dead are actually very literal words, and they mean standing up from among the corpses. And we, I don't think we have any funeral home employees here, but I'm sure that if you ask them whether corpses ever stand up on their own, the answer will be no, they do not. That's not the kind of thing that corpses do. What do they do? Well, they usually just kind of lie there, <laughs> um, kind of, you know, dead. But if you're looking at corpses, say you're looking at a graveyard, you're looking at a mausoleum or the morgue where everybody's pretty still, pretty quiet, right? Not much happening. Place is kind of stiff. Oh, but truly, that's the way it is when you're talking about corpses. But if you if you walk in there and you know there's a bunch of corpses, but hey, uh, what's happening over here to this one? Why is he standing up? Why is he not wearing a garment but is clothed? I thought he was dead. He's clearly not dead because he is standing up. He was among what we thought were corpses. We thought he was dead, but he's not dead. He's standing up, and corpses don't stand up. That's the meaning of resurrection from the dead. And the reason I give you this is not academic at all. The reason I tell you this is because it precisely explains what just happened in the fire. Three are thrown considered to be dead, expected to be dead, but in fact, the proof that they are not dead, though they're as good as dead, the proof is that they are unbound, walking, unhurt. They are standing up from among the corpses. What do you expect down at the bottom of that furnace? Corpses, all of them, all corpses, but not these guys, they're standing up. They're not doing corpse things in corpse ways. They are not corpses. They're alive. This is resurrection. I'm not saying they died and were resurrected. I'm saying, look, the symbol here is they're as good as dead. They were thought to be dead. Nebuchadnezzar thought that he had won and that he had the upper hand and he had defeated them. But actually, victory was snatched from the jaws of death right? Actually, God set them free, and God made it so they did not die. They are unbound. They are walking. They are unhurt. And this is exactly what happened with Jesus. They thought they had beaten him. They thought they'd gotten the better of him. We got rid of that problem. And to be sure, Roman crucifixion got rid of every problem. Nobody survived that. Oh, yes, there are records in England and other European nations where they used to hang people, hangings and 
15, 16, 17 hundreds. There are records of fellows who survived that somehow. I remember one monk who was going to the corpses and, and went to one of them, and, and he actually got up and pulled the noose off of his neck. And the monk said, I decided to let him go. Because God didn't take his life. Who was I? That's what the monk did. Just let him go. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the way it is with crucifixion. Yeah, you're not going to survive that. There's no way to survive that. Even if they had taken him down off of the cross, the cross is the, is the that's just the pain part. You're going to die because they took all the flesh off of your backside and half the muscle and bled you from the top of your head, which is the most profuse bleeding that there is. You're going to die. That's how it is. There's no getting out of that. They really thought we beat him, but they didn't. In fact, his death as the sacrifice for sins turned into the greatest victory that you and I could ever have. And it's the reason why you and I have a hope of resurrection from the dead. And the reason why we are joining them, um, you know, these in Daniel, uh, we are joining them in Hebrews 11.35, refusing to accept release because we also want to rise again to a better life. So that, that's part and parcel here. They are not among corpses. They are walking. They are, you know, considered dead, good as good as dead, but they're not. They're actually alive. And if you think about it, this is also what's recorded in verse 24 for Nebuchadnezzar, who, who also thought, they're as good as dead, and I'm angry with them, but instantly is astonished and gets up unceremoniously. Everything that represented, he is God, he is the king, his will be done, has just been turned on its head. Isn't that interesting? Now he's standing up because he knows you know, maybe I'm not God. Maybe there's something to what Daniel, or what Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were saying. That's where he's going, isn't it? Which is also standing up from among the spiritual corpses, isn't it? Well, in the end there, Daniel 3.26, Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, the door. As in, this is a huge structure. <laughs> it's kind of crazy if you think about it. That there must have been, this must have been carved into a mountain or something. And, you know, because there's no way to approach something that hot unless there's a door. And there's no way to protect yourself from it but to surround it by earth. Anyway, he comes near the door. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. Which they did. satraps, prefects, governors, king's counselors, that is, everybody who had been summoned out to the plain to celebrate the dedication of the golden statue that represents Nebuchadnezzar himself as God, all of them were gathered together again. And they could see that these three who refused to bow found the fire had no power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire, even. They didn't even smell of smoke. And, you know, you can't make a barbecue without coming in smelling like smoke. They are totally untouched because of the work of God. That's miraculous, of course. But everybody saw that they refused to bow. Everybody saw that they were thrown into certain death, and now everybody sees that they did not die. No harm befell them. There is only one conclusion, and Nebuchadnezzar gets it and makes it correctly. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That God has sent his messenger 
and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside their, uh, the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. That is correct. Blessed be that God, that God sent his messenger and delivered his servants. And we mentioned before, are these the only Israelites who are in Babylon? They are not. Are, the only, are they the only Israelites from their graduating class? They are not. Where is everybody else? Why aren't they taking a stand? Why aren't they holding the commandments of God? But these three did. It says they trusted in him, trusted in God, that is. They set aside the king's command, which is not a thing you do lightly. As a Christian, you are to obey the king. You are to be subject to governing authority. However, when governing authority commands you to sin, you must obey God rather than men. So they did. They yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. They were willing to give up their own lives to serve God. There's nothing that is worth your soul. There's nothing that is worth eternity. That's what they knew. That's how they lived. That's what's happening in this passage. So did they love the truth? Yes, they love the truth. You know they love the truth. You can see it. Because they put resurrection first. They put eternity first. They kept the commandment of God first. And all the other pressures of this life were brought to bear against them. But they chose to serve God. Therefore, continues Nebuchadnezzar, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of these three shall be torn limb from limb, their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. So he makes it illegal to blaspheme the Lord God of Israel in Babylon. That's pretty cool. That's a nice gesture. He doesn't have the authority to say, worship me or worship this God or, or what, you know, this that I've made and set up in the plane here. He does have authority to make a decree that you must respect. You must respect God. No blasphemy is allowed. And that protects the people for a time, you know. In the end, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Daniel 3.30, and that's the end. They got promoted. So at first, you know, they were in his favor. They were high-ranking because of their association with Daniel. Then his face changed, and he decided to destroy them. And it, at the end, they got promoted, even higher than they had originally been, which is also a kind of resurrection, right? We're, what we're getting at with that is, you know, God turns around situations. Any situation can be changed. Anything can go differently in God. When we change our hearts and set our minds to serve him no matter the cost, then we can overcome many things. And uh, indeed we must. But then we can overcome. Then things can be different tomorrow. Things can change. And there's no situation that God cannot get you out of. As Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added to you. True. Put God first. Put the commandments first. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Put God first. 
and these will be added. Put God first, and anything can be changed. Anything can get better. Anything can be accomplished in Jesus. Things that please God, things that please that where you where you go to God in prayer and you ask Him to help you accomplish His will, to spread His word, to spread the news of Jesus to your friends, your family, your acquaintances at work. He will help you to do that. It will certainly help. And that situation can be different. Or to help you to overcome temptation or other troubles that uh, are facing you in life. He can help with that as well. All of these things that mean spiritual death can be turned into spiritual resurrection if you will turn to him in simple trusting faith. Today, are you a Christian? If you are not a Christian, become a child of God today. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's where you put to death the old person and are resurrected from that water, that watery grave, if you will. A new creature in Christ Jesus, a Christian, started over. The blood of Jesus washes away everything, and you have brought about a spiritual resurrection. You're a new person in God. A fresh start, full forgiveness, and hope of heaven. Today, if you are already a Christian, but in some way have lived wrong, have made the wrong choices, let us help you with our prayers. Nobody is above temptation. We need prayers. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected.